Grant Cogswell is with us today. Uh, Grant uh, was born in L.A., raised in London, Paris, and uh, in Seattle, now residing in Seattle. He has a B.A. in English from the University of Virginia. And in 2003, he, was published, he published Pacific Bell, from which he'll be reading today. Um, it's the first part of a three-part book-length poem called The Dream of the Cold War. Uh, also, some people might know Grant as the co-author of the Seattle Monorail Initiative and co-founder of the People's Waterfront Coalition. Currently, he's a uh, writer-in-residence at the uh, Hugo House Belltown Cottages for 2004 and 2005. So please lend your ears to... Welcome, Grant. Hi. Thank you. Thanks for doing this. It's good to be in here with a poetic agenda rather than a political one. Um, I'm going to read from... Uh, Pacific Bell, which is the first part of that book-length poem, uh, which is in this wonderful book, uh, The Clear-Cut Future, published by Clear-Cut Press in Astoria, Oregon. It publishes a lot of great meta-regional uh, authors. Um, and uh, this begins sort of with some public transit topics, but soon moves to something suitably vague. The seven articulated squeaks downhill and south to Rainier Beach. It is both local and long distance. And the ones who stay the longest while errand riders come and go sit facing forward in ranks of four, kaleidoscoping their single face, all one voice, silent as you debark, a look of desire that hopes to be blessed, guesses the shape of the coming thing, breaks into its many unsatisfied selves without a wish for its final state, only what is of concern at the time. Let her, let it, let something be mine. And the street of shy glances is wandering down between the towers and toward the bay, and everyone is from everywhere, and no one is from here until now. A convertible rolls the light on Boren. Through the cha-chas round windows, the fleet is in town, the libidinous song of weekend time pitched to the higher frequencies. The junkies swing by with inky arms, Unfinished tattoos begun on installment and stalled until some Chinese heaven descends to cover them wholly, since every tattoo is unfinished because what starts in the body turns unrecognizable. Dirt or children or roads on the moon. Two girls on skateboards slalom the sailors. Six men start out for Montana on bikes. And night's arrival carries a wish that at the midpoint of our lives is half the bodies and half the minds and walkers swarm like bees around the entrances to bars which spill out music and shouting to fresher fields from hives crowded to blindness. We are made to the measure of our times. Those giants before us, their grandparents, who conquered the plains and reminisced around the slow store porches, starting a century pumping aquifers of fuel to strand us on its far side, were no greater than we ourselves are now crooked in their shadows, afraid of wars, riding the wave of their hard-gained wealth, bookish and dissipated by drink, our open weeping they saved for the dark. Our fathers played cards through their war on a ship while men without descendants died. The brave are always dead. In the shaded cross-hatching of sundown, the blocks are telescoped, and the width of the street to the bay is shown. For every loss, there is a corresponding gain. Our forebearers left the narrow box houses, this grid of streets, as these recalled their difficult times in which they had struggled and not known if anyone ever would love them. At twilight, a high jet streak scars light on the edge of space, and the reservoir grows dark. We're freer in a place where clouds move through like paper boats, across a clear basin filled from a tap, as if in the wind the traces left of who we never wanted to be were all washed eastward on the distance. Remember a day in the moat-lit car, the old turning signal like a clock, marking the waste, the sprawl of our lives. Out of all that, some force had to rise. It's you, checking into an old motel, wielding a wallet fat with grief, transporting the colors long after dark of a personal Christ deep into the wild. Thank you. Thank you. 
Today, we're um, happy to have Brian Miller here. Uh, Brian holds a bachelor's degree in creative writing from the Seattle University. And um, he has been a freelance writer uh, for Sun Magazine and a frequent contributor to poems and short stories to Fragments Literary Journal. Uh, while working in Zambia in 2001, he wrote several case studies that were produced as a documentary for British Television Channel 4 and uh, are now taught in graduate lectures at the London School of Economics. So, ladies and gentlemen, please lend your ears to Brian Miller. Hello. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity. Nick, um, I think it's a great idea. This series is a great idea. I think every meeting should start with a poem, if at all possible. Uh, I'm going to read two short two short poems today, um, both of which are part of a longer series of poems, uh, which I wrote about losing someone very close to me. Um, loss is something that a lot of people are dealing with right now in the world, across the world, so it feels appropriate to be reading these poems today. Um, the first poem is in two parts. Uh, the shift is pretty clear and doesn't really matter anyway. It's called September Evening on the Porch with a Lover After a Funeral. A cold drop just now on your palm marks the first moment of autumn. Lavender, thick as a corn cob or a farmer's wrist, swings safely in the new rain. Quiet sneaks out from behind its curtain. Where will you be when you're old as these evergreens and pressing down on the brown armrest of an old chair? Where will you be when I'm gone? The full moon sleeps behind a seamless cloud. It didn't actually happen like that. After the funeral, alone, I drove to a Chinese restaurant and sat at a long table with relatives who spoke without knowing what to say. I drank from a glass of diamonds, half listened to the silence in my own mouth, and imagined how much being in love might have made the moment different. Light wind, back of a house with a big square yard, brown eyes pleading back at mine, frightened also at the darkness behind the fractured clouds. The second, thank you, the second poem I'm going to read is called Hymnal. It's also, um, it's a bit shorter than the first. Hymnal as in a book of hymns uh, that you would find in a church. This poem um, is about the night uh, back in 2001 when my mother passed away. Uh, one of the things that we realize in these experiences of loss is that loss, loss is about grief, but it's also very much about love. Um, hymnal. There are voices singing in the house on the corner and a baby crying. In this house, we sit with you and you wait to die. Outside, fog lifts, stars everywhere, bright and far. In the change that comes tonight, let your hand be held. Let us whisper to you what you always told. The earth wraps around us, wraps around you no matter, like a hymn. Mary Whitechester started writing in 1996 and studied at Shoreline Community College and uh, really is just one of those people that comes along whose language has a force and, and, a, and a weight that, uh, that makes her really stand out. So she's uh, been published in the Spindrift Journal where the poem she, one of the poems she'll be reading today, Collateral, Collateral Patriotism, was, poem, was, was printed. Uh, last year, and uh, also she was going to be reading a poem called The Farmhouse and another one called Leave Taking. So this is Mary Whitechester. Thanks, Grant. The Farmhouse. 
Lightning strikes the old wooden shed which groans, resigned to its slow trip toward the earth and oblivion. Spiny tufted field grasses ignite through the hollow and over a rise to who knows where. Inside a white farmhouse, the woman slides her thick crusted pie onto the windowsill. She glances out the window, touches a fingertip to the glass. Perhaps this year, the grass fire will not threaten the white house, the innocent barn. She faces the window, one more person staking her life on the skin of this earth. <clears throat> and this is the leave taking. In the flaxen slant of light, she leaves for good down a quiet road. Cruel she should travel alone, given it all. Feudal doctors, the pleasant, helpless social worker, dementia medication that worked for a while. Occupational therapy given to hands like birds already flown away. Daughters with collapsed faces. The journey that begins when one falls in on oneself. Setting out with meticulous steps, she tilts her head to hear the junco's twilight call. Her back is small and set for the dark, for disappearing. Uh, this is um, collateral patriotism. The old woman resembles firewood. Her left arm is extended forever, bent at the elbow. One finger points vacantly, but where are the accused? Her body has been transformed into brown wooden sinew by some bomb or abomination. Five feet away, a baby rests, covered with dirt and weeds. His dead eyes are open, fledgling out of the nest. Four of his fingers are missing. One small leg is bent behind his back. Firebomb, missile torched village, witch terror. In lofty carpeted rooms, decisions are vomited out that will turn human beings into wood. A piece of cloth waves from a stick. We go deadly blind. Thank you. Today's poet is Sarah Mangold, and she received an MFA from San Francisco State University. Her first book, Household Mechanics, uh, which was published by New Issues in 2002, was selected by C.D. Wright for the New Issues Poetry Prize. Uh, other books include two chapbooks, Boxer Rebellion, which came out from Gong in 2004, and Blood Substitutes, uh, which came out from Poets and Poets Press in 1998. Uh, both of those are available at uh, Open Books and Elliott Bay Book Company, if your curiosity is piqued by this poem today. Um, she is the recipient of an Individual Artist Award from the Seattle Arts Commission and a McDowell Colony Fellowship, and she is the publisher and editor of Bird Dog, a journal of innovative writing and art, and she'll be reading her poem, Boxer Rebellion, and I give you Sarah Mangold. Thanks for having me. Um, this piece is based on a transcript of an oral history my great-grandmother did with the U.S. Naval Institute about her life in China with her children during the early 1900s. So it's a combination of historic facts, mismemory, family stories, and typographical errors within the transcript. So, Boxer Rebellion. 1900, 1910s, 1912, 1913, 1919, 1920 to 1940s, 1920s, 1922, 1925, 1930s, 1935, 1937, A, Abroad, Academy, Activities, After, Allowed, Alone, Among, Ancestors, and, and, Annapolis, Annapolis, Maryland, as, as, at, away, back, Battleship B, because, Bedroom, Born, Boxer, Rebellion, Buff, Bye, Bye, Captain Philip R. Alger, Captain Roy C. Smith III, USNR, Charleston, Childhood, Children, China, 
Chinaman, Climate, Comet, Command, Commander Smith, Commanding, Commanding, Quartz, Cousin, Date, Dates, Death, December. Demerits, Description, Dinner, Dinner, Dinners, Drinking During, Duty, 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 Early, 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 1900s, Early, 1930s, Educated, Education, Elaborate Experiences. Family, Families, Far East, Father, February 1912, Flu Epidemic, Food for formal, friends, friends, from future Georgia, Georgia. USS BB-15, get guest habits, Hawaii, he, health, health reasons, health, her, 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 his, his, home, housing, husband, ill, in, 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 initially, institute, is junior, June 1925 to February 1928. Kenneth Whitting's lack, late, late, 1920s, leave, lieutenant, commander, Smith, liquor, Louisa Smith Barnard, Love, Lockenbach, Map, Mary's, Mary's, Mary. Alger, Mary Alger, Mary Smith Staley. Mathematics, Meals, Meats, Memphis, Merchant Ship, Mid-1920s, Mid-1930s. Midshipmen, Military Benefits and Privileges. Moves, Mrs. Smith, Mrs. Smith. Music, Naval, Naval Academy, Naval War College. Navigator, Navy, New Newport, Newport, Rhode Island. Noah, Noah, USS, DD-343. Noah, not, not, of, of, of officers, officers, Oglala, Pacific area, Panama, Panama. Parents, parents, participation, parties, parties, physical fitness, picked, powder monkey, predicts, private, professor, prohibition, proximity, public schools, RADM. Wilson ranking receives, recollections, rejected, relative, resigns, retirement, resolve, running, rushes. Scares Mrs. Smith by sneaking on train to Baltimore as young child as child takes bones as souvenir from Philippine burial cave. Education, retirement, Roy, Roy Smith III, serves as a powder monkey at Nanking in 1927. Schooling, C, secretary, treasurer, sent, served, service, Shanghai, she, sister, Smith, Smith, commander, Roy C, Jr., USN, retired, USNA, 1910, Smith, Mary, Taylor, Alger Smith, Montgomery M, social, social, South Carolina, state, station, station, stays, submarine, superintendent, support, taken, takes, tells, that, the, 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 to, to, to her brother's chagrin, dates his company commander in the early 1930s, breaks her arm as a child in Shanghai in the mid-1920s, meets third husband in Newport after World War II, appearance causes stir in Panama in the early 30s, education, torpedo, town, translates, typhoon, U.S., Uncomfortable, undesirable, unhappy, up, USN, USNA, 1880, USS King, was, when, while, wife, with wives, word, World War One, World War I, World War II. Thanks. Thank you. Welcome to the uh, Public Safety, Civil Rights and Arts Committee. And uh, Johnny, would you um, go ahead? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks a lot. Can you guys all hear me with this microphone? Um, gosh, I was thinking on my way down here that, um, you know, poets and politicians aren't all that, all, aren't all that different. Uh, Percy Shelley said that poets were the unacknowledged legislators of the world. What he failed to mention, of course, was that poets are also the unpaid legislators of the world. And so uh, um, I, know, I don't think you guys are the right people. Maybe you're not in charge of this. But uh, if you could fund the literary arts, I would appreciate it. <laughs> um, See what we can do. Okay. And, um, so this is, a, this is a poem that is in pontoon number six, if anyone's interested, which is a great anthology of Washington State poets. It comes out once a year. And uh, it's about something, I guess it's about public safety. It's about gambling. Um, and it's called At Emerald Downs, An Old Man Rips Apart His Betting Slip and Lets the Pieces Flutter in the Breeze. He must have come from central casting in his green plaid jacket and his chartreuse trousers. He must have left a wife and family for that macanudo and a racket sure to pay his daughter's mortgage. She must be waiting in a motel by the airport. She must be watching Animal Planet, considering reservations to a place like Venezuela. She must not know her father backed a long shot, his nag ate dust behind those seven other horses. She must know nothing of this. He lost the money he made, snaking hair from other people's plumbing. On television, she watches a monkey ride a Doberman across the fast track of its owner's yard. She wonders who changes the monkey's diaper, this hairy creature so unlike her father, so unlike a tiny plumber. 
When the monkey grips the dog's collar with his ankles, she must think she would enjoy a pet like that. But no one ever asked her what she might enjoy. Though stranger things have happened, stranger than her father losing paychecks on the ponies, stranger than her dreams of watermelon margaritas, of making love with Robert Redford as Waldo Pepper on a sop with camel's paper wing. In the morning, he will ask her how she best enjoys her omelet. With his finger in a silk scarf, he will trace her cheekbones. He will call her lovely and propose. She consider the flapper's role in his upcoming feature. Stranger things have happened. Stranger things have happened in a motel by the airport, watching Animal Planet. If she was at the racetrack, she could see her father tearing up these slips of paper. But the old man is alone here, and he tramples his cigar butt on the blacktop. He must be thinking about his daughter, about the caliber of his pistol, or the willingness of his crooked fingers. He must be calculating the value of his Buick as he saunters to the window to put his final dollar on a long shot, as the bugler takes his place, as the horses line up in the post. Thank you very much, Johnny. Sure. My name is Lyle Bush. I am the program director at the Richard Hugo House, a literary arts center on Capitol Hill here in Seattle. And it's my great pleasure today to introduce T. Hetzel, um, the poet uh, reading for, for Wordsworth. T. Hetzel uh, was, was born in Annapolis, Maryland. She grew up in southern Florida. She has been in Seattle for about 10 years with stints abroad. She studied writing at the Richard Hugo House. Uh, and, in, and she's been published in Swivel magazine. And starting in the fall, she will be taking her MFA at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Um, T. Hessel. Thank you, Lyle. <laughs> um, ideas about luck. I am not an American Indian. Jim Welsh Blackfeet carried a touchstone in his pocket every day, his widow Lois said. She brought it to his wake. We invited friends and the public. The stone was put behind glass. It is worn away by his rubs for luck and his touches without thought. I cannot tell what the figure used to be. Maybe a badger? I cannot see the spirit inside it. It could have been a bull, or something indigenous to Montana, or something unrelated, like a kitten or a sea turtle made of slate or stone. Even though I'm rather disconnected from the earth, I have ideas about luck and what makes things tick. I carried in my wallet for two years a squashed U.S. penny, a gift or token. No train, no broken tooth or steel mallet, no presidential profile. The coin was crushed mechanically in a tourist lobby near Mount St. Helens in Washington State. A citizen could destroy legal tender with a crank of a gear for 51 cents. The penny became an oblong and flat talisman with a new image, Mount St. Helens erecting on May 18, 1980. In September, I finally took the Mount St. Helens penny out of the coin purse. Two weeks later, the volcano began to rumble and steam. There were earthquakes. Johnston Ridge Lookout was closed. The trails and roads were cleared of hikers and visitors. Scientists and photographers were allowed but documented. The penny is not connected to the mountain. This heart is not connected to that heart. Jim Welsh's touchstone changed nothing in his life. Thanks. Thank you, T. Hi, um, this is curated through Richard Hugo House. Uh, I'm, I'm the one of the uh, writers in residence down at the Belltown Cottages that Hugo House administers. Today, my guest is the other one, uh, who's the other poet who's living down there, and his name is James Arthur. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I can't think of a, of a harder working or a better poet in this town, actually, than James, so I'm really glad to have him here today. Um, James's poetry has appeared in The Nation, Brick, Agony, The Iowa Review, and Third Coast, and he has been a fellow at Yaddo, the McDowell Colony, and La Napoule Art Foundation in France. In 2004, he received the Discovery Nation Prize. He's a graduate of the University of Washington's MFA program and is currently one of the writers at, in residence at Hugo House, as I said, and I believe you have a manuscript that's looking for a publisher? Yeah. So uh, without any further ado, we'll present James Arthur. Thank you. Can, is this, uh, can you guys hear me? 
Um, I just want to start off by thanking you for having me here. This is really uh, very, very nice of you, and it's a testimony to, to the uh, imaginativeness and forward-thinkingness of, of the city's leadership that you have, uh, that you start your meetings with poetry. So, great. Thank you. Um, I, um, I'm going to read two poems. The, the first one I, I'm going to read for you. Um, I was in uh, France this, uh, this past winter, and I uh, visited a, a museum, um, uh, a, a Musée Picasso and a Musée Matisse, and both of them had, uh, had photographic exhibits about the lives of the two painters in question. And, um, and it was funny to, to uh, see the, <laughs> both, both painters as, as old men photographed in these, in these exhibits. The, um, Matisse as an old man was a very dapper and uh, kind of um, uh, distinguished looking old man with a neatly trimmed goatee and a, and a tie and a coat and after, it was quite famous for having had a very wild youth um, and um, Picasso on the other hand uh, was <laughs> uh, Picasso seemed to have uh, as he grew older had younger and younger girlfriends and um, it was funny to look at the lives of these two painters and think of these as being two ways one could live one's life. Um, um, growing old gracefully or, or trying to hold on to one's youth. Um, so I sort of thought about both of these writers uh, when I wrote this poem. It's called The Death of the Painter. At the end of his life, he had money and attention and certain towns were known in connection to his name. He was fastidious and wore a tie, was photographed buying brushes with a bird. Under the subtropical sky, he forgave the things long done. He hardly saw his children. By habit, was self-absorbed. His atelier was sacrosanct with the ocean for a view. When he painted, it was a descent and descent, and descent from the cross. And when he died, his late life love wept from another room. The sepulcher was simple and was all he really knew. And the second poem I'm going to read, I'm not going to introduce. It's just called uh, The Sympathy of Angels. Being of tragic bent, we incline to the unlikely future and the fated past. But we see you. We see how tired you are as you lean on your rifle or your shovel. We see that. We see the fired shells and the head they went into. And we also are shells, we glorious, unmathematical angels. Equally to all men, we have nothing to say. Go on, lay us by your ear. We work the pollen engine. We are salvation's weather men, and what great false predictors we are. We serve a monarch in a silk sarcophagus and are buried in secret graves. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. Very pleasant.